Welcome back to the Diet Doctor podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Today we have a special interview with Audra Wilford. She's the co-founder of the Max Love Project. Now this is a an amazing and powerful story that, that could have been a heartbreaking story, but instead turned into one of the most uh, uh, uplifting and motivating stories that I've heard in a long time. She got the, the diagnosis that nobody wants, that her four-year-old son had a brain tumor. And somehow through this process, through this process of initially being lost and confused, was able to turn what could have been a tragedy into an opportunity, an opportunity to really transform healthcare as we know it, to get culinary medicine into part of cancer care and into part of just care in general, specifically focusing on whole foods with a component of low carb and ketogenic diets to help the patients not only treat their disease, but treat themselves. And then that also evolved into lifestyle therapies in general, not just for the patient, but for the whole family and the building of this community. What they have accomplished is is fantastic. And the message of paying it forward, the message of giving back is a message that we can all learn from. So I really hope you enjoy this very powerful and touching interview uh, with Audra Wilford. Hi, everybody. Quick break in the interview here. I want to talk to you about exercise. How do you feel about exercise? We've heard it time and time again. You can't outrun a bad diet, and there's definitely truth to that. But the flip side of that coin is exercise is still important for health, for strength, for longevity, for health span, for so many other different reasons. But how do you get started if you're not already an exerciser? Well, we've got a course designed specifically for you. It's called our Let's Get Moving course, and it's free for Diet Doctor members. So go to dietdoctor.com and look up the weight, uh, sorry, the uh, Let's Get Moving course to get you started on your exercise journey. It's designed for people to help you learn the basics. It's got a low barrier of entry, so you don't have to go pump iron at the gym. You don't have to go run marathons. It's a much easier way to get you started on an exercise program that's going to benefit your health. And as long as you're paying attention to your nutrition and following a low-carb diet, it's probably going to work synergistically to help with weight loss, specifically with fat loss, while maintaining lean muscle mass um, and promoting health. So check out our, our Let's Get Moving course to help you get started on your exercise journey. Now back to the interview. Well, Audra, thank you so much for joining me today on the Diet Doctor podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor. Well, it's an honor to have you. And as as I've learned so much more about the Max Love Project since being introduced to you, um, it's made me even more excited to have you on to spread your message. But it starts with, as a father, a heart-wrenching story. Like Ever since I had kids, I can't even listen to stories of, of kids being being sick or being ill or having a diagnosis. But you had to deal with that firsthand when your four-year-old son, Max, was diagnosed with a brainstem tumor, a brainstem glioma. And it almost makes me just want to cry even thinking about it. And somehow you were able to go through that journey and turn that experience into an amazing opportunity to help educate the world, really, about um, navigating a cancer diagnosis and what can be done from a patient and a family support uh, perspective. So if you can sort of walk us through that whole journey. Um, I know it was a long, arduous journey. You don't have to hit on all the points of it, but give us sort of the highlights of of what got you through it, how you got to this point. Absolutely. Thank you. So Max was diagnosed August 5th, 2011, and that's over eight, about eight and a half years ago now with a brainstem glioma. And he presented with um, a number of, of symptoms, like a loss of balance. He wasn't able to identify letters um, anymore. He wasn't able to read, a lot of regression, and then early morning headaches and vomiting. Mm. And of course, as a physician, you know <laughs> what, right. what, what that's, that's a sign trouble. of. But um, we, he would wake up at five in the morning screaming in pain. He would then vomit for a number of hours and then pass out. And mm. so we took him to the doctor three times for this, and we were told he has a sinus infection. Oh, boy. And I looked it up on WebMD, and the, the, the final bullet on the page for, for the symptoms and what WebMD is signs of a brain tumor. But I didn't want to be that mom to walk into the doctor's office with a WebMD printout. So I resisted. And, you know, finally we, we did get him in an MRI. And it, I thought he had an inner ear infection. And um, I had no idea that children had were diagnosed with a brain cancer. 
I had heard of leukemia, but as a parent, I didn't know um, what happened within the walls of the children's hospital that was up the road from us. I had no idea. Yeah. And at that moment, I was inducted into a family and a community that a club, if you will, that no one wants to be a part of. But uh, we were told that Max has a, had a life-threatening um, condition. He had severe hydrocephalus. His brain was hemorrhaging, and he was rushed into emergency surgery. And um, right after that, I think... Strangely enough, the biggest gift that we were given while Max was still intubated post-surgery uh, for days, our neurosurgeon came in to us and he, he said, you know, you're going to start talking to oncology and what they're going to present you with are options to try to get more quantity of life. And at some point that will compromise the quality of his life. Mm. And I'm going to ask you to agree with me here that at that moment we stop treatment. Wow. And you simply focus on his quality of life. That's a difficult thing to have to confront for sure. Really difficult. And yeah. I know that at that point my husband heard, well, great, he's talking with us about palliative care. And what I heard was, so you're saying there's something I can do. You're saying there's a chance. <laughs> yeah. So I found incredible empowerment in the quality of life conversation. Mm -hmm. And I look back on that now, I think it was the biggest gift that we received was a physician who was willing to talk with us about the quality of our son's time. Yeah. And I, I want to get into that, but I know I'm sure a lot of people are, are on the edge of their seats wondering how is Max now? And I, so I want to cut to the chase that he's 12 years old. And he's in school. He's thriving in school. Right, seventh he, grade. He is. He was three grad, grade levels behind at one point after chemotherapy through radiation. He is now up to grade level. He. I think he has a four point GPA even. Wow, thriving. He's Fantastic. thriving. Yeah. He is still fighting active disease, um, and it's something that I mean we didn't expect to have this time that we've had with him. Right. So we we're grateful for, for each day. Wow. So uh, an amazing perspective. But so let's walk back through the process though. I mean, you're given a diagnosis, an emergency surgery, and you use the word empowered. But I think in the beginning, it's got to be so disempowering to say, you know, we're, we're at the whims of these treatments and we don't, we're, we're sort of swimming in the sea and don't know what to do. I mean, did anybody talk about, um, nutrition or lifestyle when he was past sort of the life threatening part? No. 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 And, and, and did anybody talk about sort of care for the parents? And no. No. Yeah. And it's, it's, so looking back, it seems sort of amazing that they wouldn't, but, but that's sort of a lot of the culture that we're in when it comes to this type of thing. It's all focused on survival. Here's the treatments, you know, do it and best of luck. Um, Great point. In yeah. fact, that first night in the ICU, um, I had a migraine. It was the worst night of my life. Um, and I asked for, I, I asked for something to help. And the nurse looked at me and she said, mom, there's nothing we can do to help you. Well, oh my God. Is that really what, you what think our answer this was? This is the system, yeah. right? And, and it made me think, well, why can't you admit me too? <laughs> take my insurance. You know, why can't we be in, you know, so that you can give me an ibuprofen, right. you know, at that time. But that is, it's very, very telling. And it's a part of the way that our system, it's one of our opportunities. Let me reframe this. It's right. an opportunity in our healthcare system. When we can care for the whole family, right. we can start to make such a measure, a immense positive change um, in, in, I think, the health span of the patient. Right. And not to diminish the care that he got. I mean, the no. surgery is amazing. State I'm sure of the, the art. surgeons were phenomenal the and and the nurses care in the ICU and to making sure, yes. you know, he doesn't get infections and he and he heals appropriately and he recovers appropriately in the hospital. I mean, all that care is so necessary, but it doesn't have to stop there. So what did it take for you to sort of realize there's more that we can be doing here? I think that's the the best point, and I really do want to emphasize that as well, that the care that we receive in the healthcare setting, in the hospital setting, is doing what it was what it's been designed to do, which is right. to save that life at that acute point. But what we're starting to learn is that a cancer diagnosis is not just an acute diagnosis. This is something that is, there's, there's long-term care involved in this. And I think that that was a perspective shift for 
our family at the very beginning, which was to learn that our son was diagnosed with cancer and we had this acute moment of, of focusing on saving his life, but it was going to require so much more than that. And so what happened for us, I had been a, a cook in the past, and so I had good culinary training and... I just knew the the seed was planted with quality of life. What does that mean for us? What can we do? And I thought, what can I cook for him? I, we've got to be able to do better with this. Mm -hmm. And a friend of ours sent us the book, Anti-Cancer, A New Way of Life by Dr. Servan Schreiber. Mm. And it's a beautiful memoir, uh, an amazing book. And it really does uh, speak to lifestyle medicine in, in a brain cancer, a story of a brain cancer diagnosis. And I think that's what set us off on the path initially to start was focusing on where we could be impacted Powered in the journey. Prior to uh, becoming a cancer mom, I was a leadership educator as well. And one of the things that I that I really focused on was the concept of, of, of being proactive and what we can do in a situation where my son was victimized by cancer in a moment, in the moment of diagnosis, absolutely a victim of cancer. But after that, we have the freedom to choose our response who we want to be in this, how we want to show up for him, how we um, respond to this trauma is really up to us. And so we really focused on that, trying to figure out how to make cancer give and do more. We immediately focused on giving back and we immediately focused on how we could help our son thrive through this process, not knowing how much time he had, not knowing what the course of treatment would be like, not knowing what the outcomes would be, but how could he thrive day to day? And those were the factors that I think influenced this in some weird way something you're never ready for, I felt ready for in a very, very strange way from, you know, it speaks to the life experiences we have. Right. In a strange way, you had trained for this. Yeah. Kind especially of. with your culinary background <laughs> yeah. and your leadership background. Yeah. So when it came to the culinary part of it, um, how did you come to like a low carb or a keto approach oh or was, you know, were there lots of stops in between and like, how, how did that transition evolve? So many stops in between. Max initially was in the hospital for four weeks. He came home paralyzed, went straight into chemotherapy, um, and was too young for, they, they, the, the treatment plan was let's stall the disease to the point where we could get him to be old enough for radiation therapy. Mm. Very conventional approach. And uh, so I made every mistake you could make when it came to modifying his diet and cooking. And so we, we started with removing all added sugars. We read uh, about Robert Lustig. You know, we, this, was two, this was, you know, 2011. It was fairly early. Right. Um, and so we, we read everything that we could. We thought, all right, we can remove added sugars. We know that's a problem. And somebody mentioned to me at one point, you know that um, these, these grains and starches, you know, metabolize and turn in, basically turn into sugar. And I'm Italian in my background. <laughs> there, there's no way you're telling me we have to stop having noodles. Right. <laughs> you know? um, it was pretty mind-blowing to me. So we were fortunate in many ways to have the time to make the mistakes and to cover uncover what was going on. Max's tumor is not a glioblastoma. And it's something that we we found out along the way we were able to carve out some time. We had time to make the mistakes. But the commitment we made very early on was that any other family who comes into our community wouldn't have to make the same mistakes that we made. And I wanted to be able to advance this for others so that where we started at step one, they could start at step 10 wow. and not have to go through the same mistakes. It's also a very expensive process. We uh, were fortunate to have a beautiful community that stepped up to support us. My colleagues at my uh, job at the college that I worked at gave me uh, a year of time. Their sick and vacation time pulled it together so that I could be with Max for that year. So I walked into that time saying, we've got to pay it forward. There's got to be a way that our learning could benefit others, especially because we're on a non-conventional path. Mm -hmm. And we built a community in that time. What started to happen is that we started gathering with parents who identified the same opportunities in healthcare to bridge those gaps. Again, it's understanding that, that this is a space of acute care, but um, what about the health and well-being of our children and of our families? And together as parents, we started bridging that gap together. I love how you phrase that, the opportunities in healthcare and how you built a community around that. I think that's so powerful. But interesting, when it comes to altering the diet of a child who is ill or has a diagnosis, I think the initial response is don't deprive them of anything. Give them everything they right. want. We just want them to be happy and we want to support them. And happiness is, is a big part of it. And a lot of the times that takes the, f uh, the form of, you know, sugar and cookies and sweets and hit those dopamine receptors and make them feel good. 
And this is sort of the opposite of saying, well, we want to protect your body and your healing more than hitting those dopamine receptors. So we're going to restrict all those things and take those away. Was that a challenge at first? The really wonderful point. I love that you're talking about the dopamine receptors because what you're talking about is unfortunately we equate happiness with a temporary state of potentially maybe elevation. Mm -hmm. Um, is, is that's not true happiness, right? Happiness is is a state of being. It's longer term than that. So we, I think, immediately knew that we are focusing on provision of quality time for our child, mm -hmm. and it, we really had to change the narrative for ourselves first. And that was that. That's point A. Point point A is not the nutrition part of it. It's the mindset shift. And it was saying we are going. We are not depriving, and we had to go through our, fam you know, our grand the grandparents, for for example, and say we are not depriving him of anything. We are providing the highest quality of life. This is such a priority for us. And those moments of happiness with a cupcake, as they could potentially shorten his lifespan, as they could give less quality time, as they require then at some point that he's on steroids and a number of other drugs, because we are creating an environment for him that is less well, he'll be less healthy. What type of happiness comes from that? Right. And so we had to take a, it's a longer game. Mm -hmm. And actually help people in our family and community learn that a, a cupcake may give a momentary smile, but what about sitting down and playing a game with him or reading a book or, or something else? And so it does take a big mindset shift to get there. Yeah. But you had to, you had to um, investigate all this and learn all this on your own. I mean, this wasn't something that was presented to you. So as you were navigating the field of alternative cancer therapies, I mean, there's so much out there, right? There's things about colonics and, and IV vitamin C or different IV treatments and things like acupuncture and hypnotherapy and low-carb ketogenic diets. How did you, how were you able to sort of navigate that field to say what's going to work, what isn't, what's worth the, the effort here? It's actually one of the pain points that Maxwell Project is addressing is the uh, stress that comes out of parents and families being confronted with the alternative medicine world. Mm -hmm. It's pretty stressful. Right. So you have the conventional world on one side in conventional medicine saying there's nothing else that you can do. Show up for treatment, say yes to what we do, and that's it. And then you have the alternative medicine world folks saying you're killing your kid by doing standard of care. Wow. Um, you should be... <laughs> doing A, B, C, D, E, and F or things that FDA hasn't approved and is only available in Belize or whatever it right. might be. Um, very stressful to hear from folks that you are killing your child by doing what has a base of evidence to it. Right. We can't deny that. Right. If, you know, if you want to cite the evidence in complementary medicine, we, all, we, we have to be symmetrical in our comparisons, right? Mm. And so... We actually created a, a, a Gmail account, and when we, when we received messages from people, we would say, wonderful, thank you so much for your input. Please email this, this account, and we'll hold it there. And we just put it to the side and did our own investigating. So what we looked at is how can we improve his quality of life? What it, where is their data somewhere, somehow, that demonstrates that this could help our kid um, without doing harm? And so we want to take an all-of-the-above approach. Show me everything that could help. Right. And in that space, we found our own plan, and that um, includes acupuncture, traditional Chinese medicine for us, a nutrition, absolutely a huge part of it. Um, but we did have to sift through various ideas of complementary therapies, and I think a lot of this comes down to the threshold for the family. What serves you? What serves you as a family? Um, it's not going to be the same for everyone, but helping – what we did is we teased through the evidence and now we help other families do the same. There are other organizations that focus specifically on alternative medicine mm -hmm. and we are not that organization. Um, we're focusing on something where we feel like there's a good enough base of evidence, there's good research, peer-reviewed studies. You know, So we have kind of a foundational approach to that that we feel like is important. My husband has a PhD in public health. Um, he has been combing through the med libraries and things like that in, in his work. So I think that's helped us a lot with our information competency. Mm -hmm when it comes to, to really breaking, breaking down uh, the studies and the data. But the first moment for me that was really pivotal for this was somebody gave me the book, The China Study. It was in, in, in MRI with Max waiting and yeah. you know, reading this book. And uh, it was stressful. Yeah. I started to think I'm feeding him dairy. I'm killing, I'm killing him, right? 
He needs to be vegan. He needs to be vegan or whatever it might be. It's one of the biggest challenges that we see is is just in association of of health with a particular dietary philosophy Mm -hmm. or plan or whatever it might be. When you break down the China study and you actually look at the study, you start to see all of the problems. So the main thing is don't eat... Uh, casein from a lab at very high percentages and then also inject yourself with a carcinogen, you know, and that's the only, that's the only lesson from that. But there is such emotion Mm. and vitriol and the suggestions out there from the world can be really devastating to a family that's already experiencing trauma, loss, financial instability, on and on and on. Um, so we try to de-escalate the stress in those situations and we've experienced it ourselves personally and find what is empowering in the space, what seems to work for us and serve us. Yeah. So have you been able to maintain Max on, or has he been able to maintain himself, I should say, on a ketogenic diet or at least a low-carb yes, diet? Yes, absolutely. So six yeah. and a half years now, he's been on a ketogenic diet in, in one way, shape, or form or another. So he has been on anything from something of a more therapeutic ratios, if you will, to a maintenance plan that um, is less therapeutic in the ratios, so where he would have lower levels of ketones but still be on a very low-carb approach. Mm-hmm. His dream is to live on a low-carb diet long-term. Great. He's, he's uh, experienced a, a therapeutic ketogenic diet, and for him, he misses the protein. So he would like to have a low-carb diet going into, you know, adulthood, but it's been instrumental um, in, in his plan. It has the uh, ketogenic approach we've used alongside standard of care and with phenomenal results. Yeah. We feel like the, his quality of life has been amazing. After every surgery, he actually just had a, a, brain, a, a brain surgery on November 25th, and he was doing eating salmon three hours after the six hour surgery and he was doing squats the next the next day oh, and wow. the team said this is just unreal how can someone recover from surgery like this so it's not just about um, I- enhancing treatment efficacy or, or combating you know the cancer it is also about that powerful quality of life that comes from um, being well so right. we we treat him as if he's a um, an athlete uh, more than a patient right you need recovery. And you need, you need just overall health and vitality to get through all the treatment, Absolutely. whether it helps the treatment or not. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I want to touch on briefly what you said about the um, therapeutic ketogenic diet, which is different than what most people eat just as a ketogenic diet for sort of normal health benefits um, because those diets need to be higher in fat and lower in protein, so sort of the four to one, four times fat as compared to the protein and carbohydrate combined. So it's a very specific version of the ketogenic diet. And the ketogenic diet, which it sounds like he's transitioned to, is more of sort of the the moderate protein, low carb and variable fat type of diet. Exactly. So that makes a lot of sense. So now that you're at this point where you've you've really done so much learning and growing um, from this experience, tell us how the Max Love Project um, originated and where it stands now. Sort of what are the things that you you do to help families? This is, this is quite a complicated story for us because it's so intertwined with Max's story. So I yeah. appreciate being able to tease it out a little bit separately. We started Max Love Project about three months after Max was diagnosed. That soon. That soon. Wow. And it was because we found uh, the first thing that we focused on with him other than mindset and nutrition is actually sleep. Mm-hmm. And so we found a therapeutic nightlight that just worked wonders for him. And we wrote to the company and asked if uh, we could provide them to hospitalized kids. And the company, Cloud B, wrote back and said, we'll give them to you. Please go forth and, and you know spread the goodness. Wow. And so I thought, man, they're going to need a receipt. I better start a nonprofit. So actually, when we started Max Love Project, it was intentionally not Max Love Foundation or anything like that. It's a project because we're... Um, doing something very active to support others. And we saw this as an opportunity to solve a problem, drop the mic, move on to the next problem. So we're very intentional in being a very active organization in that way. But we started out as a service project. And you know, I thought, the company's going to need a receipt. I better start the nonprofit and started it for that reason. But within a year of distributing these Twilight Turtles, distributing these night lights, really um, helping Max grow as a person while going through this process, um, 
it became really clear that we needed to do more and we started showing up in a different way. So while it started as a service project, it pretty quickly transitioned into something that uh, was designed to fill that void that we found in our own healthcare with this community of families and advocates that we had built. So I started offering cooking classes in the community. Uh, one of the things that that presented was, how is Max doing so well? He didn't, he didn't need a uh, blood transfusion going through chemotherapy. Um, he never had a neutropenic fever that resulted in a hospitalization. I mean, he was super well. Um, so I started offering the cooking classes to share how I was transitioning his, his diet and, and food and sharing the knowledge we were building. We started to build educational materials and send those out and really started to build that platform of, of creating community with the families that, that we serve. And now, gosh, uh, probably six and a half years after being at that point, we have a number of children's hospital partners. We have a mobile teaching kitchen where we have a really unique culinary medicine program specifically for pediatrics. No one else is doing what we're doing. Um, we have this program is, is tailored for the needs of hospitalized kids from the NICU to the PICU and all the clinics in between. So yeah, let's talk about that unique. for a second. That, I mean, that's amazing. But I can imagine you coming in and saying, we're going to teach these families how to cook and what to eat when the hospital food is a glass of orange juice and the pancakes and the waffles and the cereal. Um, my guess is your message of what you should be providing for your children is very different. So was there initially a little bit of pushback that I'm not sure we want this message here? It's a, that's, that's a really interesting point. The pushback for the hospital so far actually has more to do with safety, fire code regulations, okay. <laughs> and, and things like that. And what we're finding, though, is that as we get the program into the hospital and we are we are working with real food and you can start to smell the aromas of fresh herbs and lime and all of these wonderful things, you'll have folks walk by, pop into the class and say, that smells amazing. This is great. How can we get this? It's ah, infectious. Great. So for us, it's actually been kind of a Trojan horse, a good Trojan horse. Right. And so what we're doing is sneaking in real food. The, the conversations on health and wellness have now pervaded the hospitals we work with. So we're working with associates. Um, so the HR department, for example, is, is utilizing the program for their wellness Program because the the biggest one of the biggest costs to any hospital is actually their own healthcare costs for mm. their own associates, right? So we're a part of that answer. Um, we what found an interesting transition starting to help the the kids who are the patients, and then ending up helping the employees and the workers as well. I mean, yes. that's powerful. And yeah. how incredible is that when those employees come back around and say, you know, real food has helped me too. Yeah. So as the entire culture in the hospital starts to change, what then happens is it begs the question, why are we providing this, I'm not even going to call it food, these products to our patients? Right. The clear liquid diet is 100% carbohydrate. Ugh. To the to kids who are healing, the most inflamed, the most right. in need, they're getting the least nutritious food possible. Right, and they're usually getting the liquids because their body can't handle the solids right. at that point, which right. just shows how much healing they need to do, and right. you're giving them pure carbohydrates. Right. So we're, I really feel like this, this program coming in is something that is making a beautiful transition in the hospitals that we're working with. So right now we're working with a number of children's hospitals on creating this curriculum ourselves. We're creating it, uh, it to be an open source, so to be basically going to be pro protected with a creative content Commons license that will make sure that anyone can utilize it, but just not commercialize it. Oh. So we're producing it for the greater good. That's um, one of our partners is the University of Arizona and their nutritional sciences department. They have students testing all of our recipes right now in a lab. And so these are nutrition students who are super charged about culinary medicine. They're learning. And it's just, that's the most wonderful thing to me to see is just the layers of evolution and learning and growth among everyone involved. And what I found in all of our partners is that people want to do better. They want the system to serve patients better. Uh, the, the clinicians we work with are almost desperate for something to give their patients to inc improve their quality of life. Mm -hmm. They're tired of seeing poor outcomes. Yeah. They're tired of the misery. They're tired of the pain. They're tired of seeing their cancer patients who are five years post-treatment and struggling 
to hold down a job. They're struggling with obesity and diabetes, secondary cancers, the late effects of treatment because they don't have a true health and wellness paradigm in place. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, the, the initial cancer treatment may stop, but the health battles do not stop and those continue Absolutely. and those need to be addressed. So you, you, you mentioned the term real foods, that you, this program is emphasizing real foods. Is it by default then low carb? Do you use the word keto, low carb? Do you use or do you give options? Like, Tell us a little more detail about Absolutely. that. Absolutely, yeah. So we give options. So we meet families where they are. Mm-hmm. And that's going, there's such a spectrum and a variety there of, of needs. And so we are necessarily, we believe that a metabolic approach here for any disease state is, is, is the most important thing. And that when we come to real whole foods, when we focus first on real whole foods, we automatically help families get closer to whatever their goal is in that space. Yeah. Um, the biggest need that we see with most any hospitalized family is going to be there's, there's a high utilization of processed foods. Right. So if we can make that first step into making utilizing whole foods powerful, then we're getting somewhere. So the, the, the reason why culinary medicine as a term is so significant to us is that what we've, we've seen, I went to culinary school, I learned the skills. So when it came to modifying food for my son, I had a significant skill set to do it and still was frustrated. I still came up against roadblocks. So I thought, what, what does a mom do when she doesn't know how to cook or like to cook. Right. And uh, you have kids. Do they have any culinary education <laughs> in the schools anymore? In the schools, no. <laughs> no, no. It has to happen at home, right? Yeah, I mean, there are those videos where, where people go into the schools and they hold up different vegetables and they say, yeah. what is this? And the kids just give them that blank stare because they don't see vegetables. They don't handle food. They don't right. know what it's supposed to look like. Yeah. So this is profoundly disempowering in um, when you are faced with a health crisis. hmm and that's our standard American environment. We are so distanced from our food and food sources and understanding. And now we're three generations in to some families who've never cooked. Right. So a part of the answer is to combine cooking skills, that culinary knowledge, with the uh, process of understanding and utilizing whole foods. That really is the magic. That's that that that's what we need. We need it in our schools. We need it in our libraries. We need it in our hospital. We need it everywhere. Yeah. But we're taking on our little chunk of that. And if we feel like we can empower uh, families to do a little bit more in the kitchen and start building that interest and knowledge base, then we will start accumulating um, positive health behaviors, and it's going to only escalate the good yeah. for families. So. That is kind of our, our basic foundational perspective. We call it fierce foods. Fierce? Fierce foods. Fierce foods. Because kids don't like healthy. <laughs> and actually, uh, it's talking about terminology, I mean, parents don't. I mean, how many how many of your friends even are like, let's go to this healthy place that just opened up down the street. Like, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Doesn't sound very uh, fun. The connotation yeah. isn't great. Right. Um, so we're working with a positive connotation, something we're talking about, really powerful fuel in your body for a variety of different reasons. And it seems to really resonate with, with kids and families more than the conversation around healthy. Because is food really healthy? It's nutritious, right? right. But you're in a state, uh, your state of health is something that is a, is a, is a much larger question <laughs> um, and opportunity. So that's our foundational approach. We then have opportunities to, to grow in that. So for some families, there are many families who would really, really benefit from a therapeutic ketogenic diet or some version thereof, or a really great low carb approach. And we work with families personally and directly to help identify what's best for them. And it's really different for, for everyone. But we start with a platform of whole real foods and then we go from there. And I, I can just imagine as the doctors see this taking place in their hospitals that they then are going to bring this up with the patients more. Because I know that was something that no doctor brought up with you. You had to do the research, you had to bring it up. And the ultimate goal would be that this is just part of the treatment plan, that when you sit down with your doctor, that the doctor includes this in the treatment plan. So you're starting to see some inroads there as well? That is exactly the goal, is to enhance standard of care with a health and wellness roadmap that goes right along your traditional roadmap. 
Yeah. And can actually help mitigate directly some of the effects that you see in the traditional roadmap. And mm -hmm. what if we could lower the toxicity of treatments, even lower doses, because we're on a health and wellness plan. My son didn't need steroids going through any of the any of the treatments he had, like radiation, for example, because he was on a ketogenic diet and he did beautifully well not needing that medication. Yeah, that's amazing. So so for for the listeners, steroids are commonly given because with the sort of damage or the injury to the tissue, there can be swelling and steroids are potent um, anti-inflammatory to decrease the swelling, but they're going to drive glucose up. They're going to increase insulin and, and which are going to have potential negative downstream effects. So if you can take care of the healing process with nutrition and not need that, that seems it's a big like win, a, right? Yeah, it's a big win. Now, not that there's research behind that to say that it can happen, but sure makes sense and certainly worked in this in this and our, case. Right, and our doctors followed the evidence um, in some of the ketogenic research, uh, Dr. Sheck's research, for mm -hmm. example. Um, but that is something that we're seeing a change in. So when Max was diagnosed, we asked to have a dietitian on the team. I said, why would you want to talk to a dietitian? He has no clinical uh, deficiencies. Right, N nutrient deficiencies. Yet. That's what like you look at. Does he have a current nutrient deficiency? Right. Not what can right. we do to I prevent- I said, we want to prevent it though. Yeah. I said, well, uh, okay, fine. We'll have a dietitian come in on the first meeting. I said, how do I get, I don't know. I don't know, but I think he might need more kale or, or tell me you know, what he needs, but do you have smoothies? Do you have shakes? What can I give him? And I was handed a shake menu that consisted of carnation instant breakfast, yeah. different versions, right? It was like ice cream, carnation instant breakfast, yeah. sweetened milk. Mm -hmm. It was it was all sugar mm -hmm. and some fat, but it was it was basically all sugar. And I looked at that and I said, I read that New York Times article that just came out in January with Gary Taubes, like you know, the Robert Lustig is sugar toxic. Right. This isn't making sense for me just as a normal parent. Yeah. You know, I had questions about this as it was or as it stands. And today, same hospital, when a family is diagnosed, they have their oncology dietitians are fully versed in the ketogenic diet. And the shake menu now includes avocado and whole foods blended. It's a totally different scenario. Yeah, what a wonderful, what a so wonderful there's example. <laughs> there's to, hope. <laughs> to see what you've done. I mean, this has changed because of what you've put in place. I mean, that, that's phenomenal. Yeah. We have to figure out how to scale it. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that we're working on right now with this hospital-based culinary medicine program is how to scale the change. And is that the Charlie cart as well? And so that is, we originally started that program with, with a cart called the Charlie cart. And we originally started uh, actually working to see if their curriculum, they have their own curriculum is feasible in the hospital setting. And it's used in schools and a lot of community organizations. They do a wonderful job. They're an amazing organization. But we ended up really deciding as a team, and this is our culinary medicine collaborative, and we have partners from Willette Children's Hospital in Savannah, Chalk Children's um, in Orange County, California, and the University of Arizona working on this together. We decided we need to make our own curriculum. Mm -hmm. So, and we're now using a mobile cart that is uh, is actually a little bit different, um, and it's, it's lighter, and it's, uh, it's just structured differently. But we're learning because we have to deal with hospital fire code, right. regulations and sanitation and on and on. There are a lot of layers. Yeah, sure sounds like it. And then in addition to the whole nutritional cooking aspect, you also have the Ohana project. Thank you, so yes. Ohana in Hawaii, which I learned from listening to your talks, it means family. So this is a project designed at supporting not just the patient, but the whole family. So tell me more about that. So this is something that we've learned in our journey. Uh, we started out with this nutrition platform and, and we quickly learned that there's so much more to it than just nutrition, that when you're in a space of, if you just look at, the, at one's macronutrient intake, you're missing a good most of the picture, right? Mm -hmm. We quickly learned that mindset is important, that uh, mindfulness, stress reduction, significant sleep, physical activity, our community, you're, you're, there's significant research to show that, that our communities are therapeutic. Right. Um, the, the sort of environment that we're immersed in, how we can mitigate the toxicities in our environment around us, all of these things are really important to us. And we call that our Be Super Action Plan. And that is our foundational action plan for thriving, for health and wellness, for the family. The other thing that we learned is that there's no patient, uh, you know, child in isolation, that, that we thrive in communities, but in family units. And so providing care designed simply for the child is really not quite effective, especially when it comes to lifestyle medicine and health behavior change. We started to learn a lot about uh, trauma, um, trauma in the family, trauma for the parents, 
um, grief, that um, unaddressed grief from the beginning when your life changes overnight right. leads to a good amount of, of PTSD and resulting traumas and difficulties that make it very difficult to engage in lifestyle medicine, health behavior change. Mm -hmm. So we started to build a lot of programming around this. You know, acupuncture for the whole family, for example. Um, and a lot of our programming is designed to support parents. We have a support group of over 1,300 parents wow, 1300. online. And we provide significant social support to the parents, but also evidence-based research and targeted interventions. We have boot camps that are fully online. Um, we have mindfulness boot camps for mom and for dad. They're separate, actually. Um, we have a number of empowerment workshops, um, just programs that we offer to really focus on how we can be empowered um, as a whole, as a family on this journey. So the Ohana project came out of that. We actually had a, it's an IRB approved study um, with the Children's Hospital of Orange County. And we delivered a, a core set of services to the whole family, it included health coaching and nutrition, cooking classes, acupuncture for the whole family, um, yoga for the whole family, health education, health behavior education workshops. Um, and we found significant improvement to quality of life. Uh, my husband, who um, is, teaches at UC Irvine in public health and health behavior change, designed and, and assessed um, this, this study. And he can speak to the results beautifully, <laughs> um, so much better than I can. But really, at the end of it, what we found was significant um, improvement in quality of life uh, uh, and a whole host of, of different measurements. Um, we see this as the potential and the future of healthcare. It's really functional medicine um, at its core, mm -hmm. I think, in many ways, um, and designed to support and serve the whole family. And this is when we start to see real changes uh, for patients short term and long term. Yeah, I can imagine from, on so many different levels, because one, if the parent's leading by example, the child is going to learn that so much better than just being told to do something. But also, the, the better the parent is taking care of themselves, the better they are able to lend support to their child and to lend support to each other. And I just think that's so important. And I mean, you really are changing the, the face of healthcare and certainly cancer care and healthcare in general by, by implementing this. I mean, it's amazing. It's a huge paradigm shift. Yeah. And, and, and we know that the most at-risk people for cancer in this country are people who have survived cancer. And what, we, what do we need to do to change that, that paradigm? And it is really looking at how we can be optimally well at living our best days possible, you know, with the time we have, whatever that yeah. might be. And this is done in a family unit. And we've had so many parents come through our program saying, you know, we, we entered in this for our child, but this has saved us. Wow. You know, this is the, I didn't know that maybe I had metabolic disease. I didn't know that I could re reverse my obesity. I didn't know that I could, you know, address my type 2 diabetes this way. And you start to think there's a glimmer of hope at that point that this is what we need in our healthcare system. Yeah. This is exactly it. Right. And, and the lessons your son must have learned going through this about giving back, about paying forward. I mean, those are lessons we all need to learn. I mean, we get so wrapped up in our own lives about how busy we are and the things we have to do and how terrible the things that we're confronting are. They're nothing compared to what you had to go through and the way you were able to turn this around um, and the lessons you've learned and the lessons Max has learned. I mean, it's just, it's a remarkable story that that I think everybody needs to, to listen to and help put themselves into perspectives, their own um, thoughts about how they interact with the world and give back to people into perspective. Um, so you, and you never wish that anybody goes through this, but you certainly wish if they have to go through an experience like this, that they can turn it into something exactly like you have. And, and that's remarkable and very commendable. So thank you for that, for sure. Thank you so much. That was a powerful part of our story here was empowering Max to not see himself as a victim, yeah. but to feel empowered. And if you, I don't know if you've read Sheryl Sandberg's book, Option B, oh, yeah. um, with Adam Grant. It's such a powerful book. And part of that is the empowerment that comes from giving, especially mm -hmm. when, when, when facing grief and loss, which in any, any journey, 
like this, like a childhood cancer journey, um, even when a child survives, there's grief for the life that you were lead, that the, the way that life changes, there, there's grief in that as well. But we also have a significant number of bereaved families we work with. So in addition to the social support that we provide, the online support, the cooking classes in the hospital and the community, we provide a good amount of social support based um, services directly in our community. And that includes a good amount of work in, in bereavement. And once a family starts with Max Love, there's never a, a point where you're excluded. We are always in our family, mm -hmm. and that includes the entire timeline. And our focus on quality of life extends to the entire family. And so after a child dies uh, from cancer or something related to the treatment, you know, the family is usually left with nothing. Right. The support system that was there when the child was in treatment is gone. Right. And we will always be a family and we will always be there for these families. And everything that we do in our Be Super Action Plan applies to a family from day one of diagnosis through the grief and bereavement process. And it's all about optimizing our quality of life and, and living the best days possible with the time that we have and, and, and whatever the cards were dealt. Right. Wow. Such an amazing message, and I'm, I'm so glad I, I learned about you and I learned about the Max Love Project and all the amazing things you were doing. So if, if our listeners want to learn more, if they want to know how they can contribute, if they want to keep up with all the, the latest things, the amazing things you're accomplishing, where can they go to learn more? They can go to maxloveproject.org. Mm -hmm. We're also on Instagram and Facebook under Max Love Project. And I just want your listeners to know that they really, really matter to our movement not only in their ability to amplify our messaging and, and you know, show support to us on social media and things like that, but in their own individual journeys by modeling the way, by bringing this, uh, this focus on quality of life and of, of health optimization to the mainstream, you're helping children fighting cancer and rare diseases and those immersed in the healthcare setting because we need to change the entire environment. The standard American environment or standard any other, you know, kind of location environment yeah. um, needs to transform for all of us. And so the, the folks that are involved with Diet Doctor, which is one of the our, our prime resources actually for our families, we love what you all do. Um, and your listeners, those who are participating are really active agents of change for us. Right. We depend on everybody to elevate the space and to bring the messaging forward. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. And can people contribute to the to your cause, either with their, their time, their energy, or, or their money? Absolutely. Time, mm -hmm. talent, treasure, all of it, all of it matters. And we have, we have a volunteer link on our, our website um, that includes being active on social media and just helping us get the word out. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much. And please thank Max for us as well for all that he's doing to help with this movement. Um, and I can't wait to see more out of the Max Love Project. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.